back at chapter 2, verses 18 through 19. I'm going to be reading from the Amplified Version. <clears throat> what profit is the carved image when its maker has formed it? It is only a cast image and a teacher of lies. For its maker trusts in his own creation as his God when he makes speechless idols. Woe, judgment is coming to him who says to the wooden image, Awake, and to the speechless stone, Arise. And that is your teacher. Look, it's overlaid with gold and silver. And there is no breath at all inside it. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 through 23. Not, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I'm going to preach this morning on this subject, the unknown God. The unknown God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy, O oh God. We thank you for your presence, Father. We magnify you today, O Lord. I pray you anoint my mind and my spirit. Anoint these lips, Lord, to say only what you would have me say, Jesus. Anoint our ears to hear and our hearts to receive that we might grow in you today, O God. Have your will and have your way today. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen, amen. And you may be seated in Jesus' name. Thank you, brother. You may have to turn me down. I feel like I'm blasting off the walls. Praise God. That's a little better. Right there. In the book of Acts chapter 17, verses 18 through 23, the scripture begins to read, and again I'm reading from the Amplified Version. And some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to engage in conversation with him. And some said... What could this idle babbler with his eclectic scrap heap learning have in mind to say? Others said he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching the good news of Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and brought him to Arapagus Hill, Arapagus Hill, Hill of Ares, the Greek god of war, saying, May we know that what this strange new teaching is which you are proclaiming. For you are bringing some startling and strange things to our ears, so we want to know what they mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners visiting there used to spend their leisure time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. Verse 22, So Paul, standing in the center of Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I observe... With every turn I make throughout the city, that you are very religious and devout in all respects. One interpretation says that you're very superstitious. Now, as I was going along and carefully looking at your objects of worship, I came to an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you have, what you already worship as unknown, this. I proclaim to you. In verse 18, these were among the leading philosophies of the time period. They neither believed in a personal God. Indeed, the Epicureans were confirmed atheists. 
Their goal was to get as much out of life as possible. They felt that pleasure was the highest virtue and that pain was the opposite. Their motto, and still persists to this day, was and is, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die. The Stoics had a strong fatalistic sense of duty, seeking to improve the inner man. Their attitude toward life was one of ultimate resignation, and they prided themselves on their ability to take whatever came. Their motto in modern terms was grin and bear it. They urged moderation. Don't get over-emotional either about tragedy or, happen, or happiness. Apathy was regarded as the highest virtue of life. And this Areopagus hill was also known as Mars Hill, named for Mars, the Roman god of war. It was the place where the ancient Greek Areopagus council convened and had varied powers in the course of history. In Roman times, it was where the supreme government of Athens would meet. And I ran across an article about a man named Don Richardson, and he had wrote a book and tells a fascinating story of the altar to the unknown God. This story is based upon a number of historical documents and sources which Richardson cites in his book. In short, the story begins in the 6th century before Christ with the city of Athens was being devastated and decimated by a mysterious plague. When no explanation for the plague could be found and no cure was in sight, the approach was to assume that one of the city's many gods had been offended. So the leaders of the city sought to determine which of the gods it was and then determined a way of appeasing that god. This was no easy task since the city of Athens had over 30,000 known gods within it. It was literally referred to as the God capital of the world. Such a strange idea. One said, a place so full of gods that the Athenians must have needed something equivalent to the yellow pages just to keep tabs on the many deities already represented in their city. What corner am I on today? And which one is this? And who do I bow to? There's not enough days in the year cover so many gods. When all efforts failed to discern which god had been offended and which had brought the plague upon the city, an outside consultant was brought in from the island of Cyprus whose name was Epimenides. Epimenides concluded that it was none of the known gods of Athens which had been offended, but some as yet unknown gods. 30,000 here. None of those guys. It's one that we don't know yet. He proposed a course of action which it worked, which if it worked, would at least provide a possible remedy for the plague. He had a flock of choice sheep of various colors kept from food until they were hungry. And on the given day, he had these sheep turned loose on Mars Hill on what was a very succulent pasture. For any sheep not to have eaten his field would have been unexplainable. He had the sheep turned loose and watched very carefully to see if any sheep would lie down and not eat, even though hungry and in a prime grazing area. Several sheep, to the amazement of those watching, did lie down. And altars were erected at each spot where a sheep lay down, dedicated to an unknown God. On those altars, the sheep which lay in that spot were sacrificed. And almost immediately through history, we are told that the plague began to subside. Over a period of time, the altars were forgotten and began to deteriorate. And one altar, it seems, was restored and preserved in commemoration of the removal of the plague by calling upon the unknown God. Who would have thought that centuries later, a foreigner named Paul would refer to this altar as the starting point of the sermon on Mars Hill. And as the apostle walked around the city looking upon these 30,000 gods, there was one Peteronius, uh, one of the ancient historians, that said it was easier to find a god in Athens than to find a man. 
That's a sad state of affairs. There was a worship of this God of Mars, and I wonder to myself, what if Paul had ventured up on that hill at this time of worship? Each year, the Ferrari Marti was held, beginning on the calends of March and continuing until the 24th. Dancing priests called the Sali performed elaborate rituals over and over again, and a sacred fast took place for like nine days. And the dance of the Sali was complex and it involved a lot of jumping and spinning and chanting things like, Father of war, protect us and give us a harvest of bounty. Because they believed that this God of war not only uh, would give them victory in battle, but He would supply their need in crops and in harvest. And so what if Paul come up right in the middle of this festival and this worship and, and so then he began to preach to them in Acts chapter 7, and, and Paul began to preach, I proclaim to you a God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that He is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands as though He needed anything, seeing He giveth to all life and breath and all things, and have made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and have determined the times before appointed in the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after Him and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. He said, For in Him we live, and we move and we have our being as, as certain also of your own poets have said. For we are also His offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God. We ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone. Or graven by art and men's devices. And at the time of this ignorance God once winked at. But now commanded all men everywhere to repent. If Paul were to take the same step into the 21st century, if he were to step into our city or step into our house, our neighborhood, maybe even step into some of our churches, would he find there a wooden idol not seen with the natural eye, but observed by the hearing of its worshipers as they begin to chant something like, Oh, money! You are the answer to all that ails me. Money, if I only had more of you, I would truly be happy and content. Oh, money, there is nothing that you cannot do for me. Money, I will work hard for you every day. I will sacrifice time with my family for more of you. Oh, money, I will skip church just to be able to gather more of you to me. Money, once I get a hold of you, I don't plan on letting and realize that by the chanting of our very voices we were worshiping some God that we could not see with our eyes nor hear nor could it do anything for us. Paul would have to start preaching. You need to repent because while you have been wasting your breath worshiping money there's been a true God that you haven't acknowledged yet. He's been unknown to you and He's a God that owns a cattle over 10,000 hills. His riches are let me tell you about the unsearchable riches of Christ. My God shall supply all of your needs according to His riches and glory. No servant can serve two masters. For either you will hate the one and love the other, or else you will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. He's been right here all along, and you've never made an effort to Perhaps he would journey to another city, another house, and he would begin to hear the chanters and the worshipers begin to worship another idol, and they would say something along the lines of, Oh, fear, 
Thank you for spending so much time with me. I'm afraid of what I could do without you. Fear your horror films. They comfort me. Thank you for the nightmares and the sleepless nights. Oh, fear. Fill my mind with your spirit so I can worry over what if. I, I'm not going to dance in church. What if someone makes fun of me? I'm not going to lift my hands. What if I'm the only one doing it? I'm not going to pray out loud. What if someone hears me? I'm not going to the altar. What if I'm the only one that goes up there? Fear, I praise you for protecting me. You have kept me from failure, rejection, and the unknown. Even though the unknown might be that unknown God who said, I have erected all around us and Paul is preaching repent repent oh time I can never get enough of you I don't have time to pray because my favorite show is on I don't have time to read my Bible because I need to see what my friends are posting on Facebook I don't have time to go to church meeting on Sunday and Thursday and again on Tuesday well that of my 168 hours a week. I just don't know if I can spare any more time. Come on. Five hours. Six max. But we'd rather bow a time than get a hold of an unknown God because He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. He supersedes time. He was before time began and He'll be when time's all gone. And He will be the one who judges the quick and the dead. And on that day, we're going to hear Him say one of two things. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Or enter into your reward. Or depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. While there is still breath in our body and while there's still time on the clock, we better make up in our mind. I'm going to get to know. And as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Yes. I've got to do everything that is necessary to make sure that Jesus Christ is not the unknown God in my life. I've got to do everything necessary to make sure that Jesus is not the unknown God that Paul wouldn't walk into my living room and see all the Bama stuff on the wall and, make, and, and, and come to know that I'm faithful to every game and watching every game and having my jersey on and chaining. Woo! Roll Tide! But when I come to the church house, I can't open my mouth. I can't raise my voice. I'm not going to wear the suit or the tie and dress clothes. I'm going to come in the scrumpy stuff and who cares and it's just us getting together and... going to find that we've got an idol made of wood that we created with our own hands that can't talk to us, that can't answer our prayers, that can't respond to us. And yet, because somehow in our twisted minds we created it, it's worthy of worship. You don't worship the creature more than the Creator. When we read and break down in the Amplified Version Will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work in iniquity. It says, I never knew you. <clears throat> Depart from me. You are banished from my presence. You who act wickedly, disregarding my commandments. Because it was Jesus who said, If you love me, keep my commandments. In John 14. And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another comforter that He may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth Him not, neither knoweth Him. But ye know Him, 
for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. You will never truly know him until you have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And even after you come to that intimate place with him in the Holy Ghost, you can only begin to grow level by level in your knowledge of him. You can say, well, I finished it, I, I, I repented. I was baptized in Jesus' name. I received the Holy Ghost. Praise God, I'm born again. I'm ready to go. And then sit back on a pew and never worship, never dance, never lift a voice, never intercede, never call His name, never have Him wake you up in the middle of the night and call your name. He said, my sheep will know my voice. That's right. I don't want to be the one to stand before judgment and Him look at me and say, depart from me. I never knew you. And me look over my life and go, but where? Weren't you there when I cast out that devil? And weren't you there when I prophesied? And weren't you there when I baptized in Jesus' name? Were you not there? And he said, I never knew you. I was never intimate with you. The same word knew as Adam knew his wife Eve. And they conceived. The place of intimacy with Him where you really get to know Him. In the midnight hour when you can't sleep and you're wrestling around, if you roll over and get on your face and begin to pray, He'll start talking to you and moving in your spirit. And it's in those hours of sacrifice, in those hours of obedience, that suddenly His voice becomes so clear and so loud and so real. And you can finally step into His presence. But you're not ever going to get to that place if you keep rolling over and wrestling with sleep all night long. Preferring sleep over His presence. Preferring sleep over His Spirit. Preferring sleep. Preferring things. Preferring time. Preferring money. We, never, we, we, we can't get to know Him if we don't spend time with Him. Right. I don't understand how we've gotten to a place as a church and I'll stick with church. As a church who profess to be Christ-like, who profess to be the sons and daughters of God, who profess to be Spirit-filled, and they don't know how to pray when that is the single most ingredient to getting to know Him. Right, right. You can read this thing front to back, but until you get on your face and the Spirit moves in you and starts making it pop out to you and talk to you and sing to you and meet you where you're at, then you begin to know Him. But if I'm too caught up and too busy, don't have time, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. No, 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 no. Because there's going to come a day when you can't get to it. Right, right. He said, work while it's day, for there's a night coming. In January this year, there's a prophetic word that came forth, and he said, there's a dark time coming to this land. And it's going to be difficult to seek me out. But as for me and my house, we're going to cut down some trees and put on the mosquito protectors and whatever we got to do to get into the Spirit. There's going to come a day when we're driving down the road and we're going to know His voice because He might say, hey, you need to turn left right now. No questions asked. And while you're, you don't have time to debate, was that God or me? And you pull up on a search when you're looking for a Christian See if they're going to deny their God or be beheaded. And this is the hour that we're living in. He said, hey, why are you worshiping this dumb stuff? It's wood. You may, it's, this idol can't even speak to you. And you're consumed with having more of it. Come on, the stuff I was doing about money. Oh, money, if I, if I, if I could just have more of you. That's what we ought to be saying to Jesus. If I could just have more of you. Yes, I've had your spirit. Yes, I've got your name. Yes, I believe in our repentance. But I need more. I'm not satisfied with just the status quo. I'm not satisfied with just regular church services. I'm not, I'm not just satisfied sitting on a pew. I want to know you. And Paul can walk through the streets and Peter can walk through the streets and his shadows would heal. His shadows would... Peter can do 
that. I can do that too. There's no respecter of persons. I can have the same anointing. I can have the same walk. I can have the same relationship. But remember Peter hung upside down. Mars Hill, 30,000 gods all over the place. These Gentiles worship anything and everything that moved. And just in case we missed one. Just in case this plague was by one that we didn't know. We're going to sacrifice some sheep to an unknown God. And isn't it ironic that it was sheep? Isn't it ironic? 600 years before Paul climbed that hill, it was sheep that lay down on top of the hill and were sacrificed on an altar and it removed the plague. It was an altar to an unknown God. I've heard story after story about Krishna worshipers and Allah worshipers and getting fed up because their God's not answering them. And finally getting to a place where they said, okay, I've heard about this Jesus. And I don't know Him. And their simple prayer sometimes would be, Jesus, if You're real, and You would show Yourself to me, then I'll forsake all those other gods. And I will serve You. And somehow, in their desperation, it wasn't a sinner's prayer they prayed. It wasn't some formula they came up with. But they were already sick and tired of these non-performing gods that they never were always demanding but never returning. Always taking but never giving. They finally got fed up and said, I want to serve a God that's real. Not some dead thing made with men's hands that cannot answer me when I pray. Work is not more. Uh, hear me. Work is not more important than Bible study. Right. Right. It's not more important than Bible study. Work is not more important than prayer. It's not. Having their songs all together. It's not more important than beginning to pray 15 minutes before service. Kill the last song. Don't even practice it. I promise you. If you get in the spirit before service and you get ready to play that song, it's going to be anointed. But you can get up here and make it all pretty right to five till and when service starts you get up there and play a thing and it might sound pretty but there may be zero anointing to start moving. Because you didn't take the time to get to know the God that you were singing to. You were more interested in learning the song. There's so many people that could quote this thing. I bumped into one the other day in Lowe's. Naked, he was quoted had miracles in his life, signs in his life, wonders in his life. And he was still in the spirit of error and could not see it because he justified where he was at by his material blessings because of the increase in his life. Look, I don't care what I have as long as I have him. That's true. If I've got to be destitute and broke and, and, and I've been there, the saving grace for me was being able to go to a place when I didn't have money and pray and say, God, I can't feed my family today. And somebody knocked at my door because he knows me and he knows my voice. And he said, that's my son and I'm going to move heaven and earth to see that he gets what he needs. He loves you that much and he doesn't deserve to be the unknown God. Come on. Come on. If he laid down how much more should we lay down ours for Him? We're worried about time when this time on this earth doesn't amount to anything compared to eternity. And what makes us think that we're going to be any happier? Spending this time like this, keeping Him so far away, and getting to heaven somehow mysteriously and having to deal with being with Him all the time. All of His rules. All of His commandments. 
defenses and safeguards that he's given us to protect us and keep us, and still yet he remains unknown to us. There are deeper things in the spirit that we haven't even tapped into because we all have a comfort zone. We all have a place where we'd rather hang out here because I know it. And some of us have allowed fear in our life and it binds up our confidence, it binds up our faith. We have trouble believing that He can love us with the things that we have gone through. Was He somehow responsible for the rejection I received? Was He somehow there allowing that to take place in me? Did you do that to me? And we will almost get mad at our God just because He doesn't bail us out of every trouble we get into. But come on, look around you. When a parent bails out their kid and every time they get in trouble, they never learn to grow up and become useful anywhere in anything. Come on. Because somebody is going to bail me out of my trouble. But He did promise us, I'm not going to let you go through more than you can bear. If I brought it to you or you stepped into it and I am with you, I'll help you through it. I'm going to see you through it. I ain't going to take you out of that every time. But I'm going to walk with you while you go through it. He said, we shall know Him by the fellowship of His suffering. I'm blessed. I have things. I'm thankful for those things. But again, I had to suffer some things to have the things. And I had to suffer some things from men to have the revelations that we walk in. That you're getting for free. Paul, John, we like to read Revelation and we still don't know what all it means. But here's John. We're thinking, man, to be John, to hear God, to see all that stuff and write all that down and have angels stand in front of you and open seals and you see visions. But John was nearly boiled alive. He was boiled. He just didn't die. That's great. Good. Line up at the boiling pot and you can have the same revelation. Not me. There are those who talk a good talk. weighs heavy on us when we're trying to help somebody who's not willing to help themselves. We can't save them. But we can get close enough to God to be an example to them. And we can get close enough to God to be a voice at times to them. But we can't save them. We can teach them and we can baptize them. But He fills them. He saves them. And sometimes we get caught up on the work of God and forget the God of the work. And I rush just for example. And I rush to get everything ready for vacation Bible school. All of our work. I pray that our prayer life didn't get cut short there was just one more decoration we had to finish. Right? Because the work, if not saturated in prayer, the anointing, it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. We can have a great vacation Bible school and great lessons and good fun. But if we need that breakthrough to pray these kids through the Holy Ghost, it's going to take prayer. It's going to take fasting and all the decorations and the fun stuff. We can't afford to let Jesus be that unknown God. He's not going to be my unknown God. He's not going to be my unknown God. 
I was praying yesterday, seeking His face. This came over a lot differently in my spirit. But then the more I went through it and prayed over it, and the words said in my spirit, the more I spoke to Him, the more the Lord started pulling on my heartstrings. And he pulled, and I want to stay again, make sure I got it all up on my head. Mm, come here, come here, come here, come here. And all I want to do is go to prayer and weep and feel him and know that he's standing right next to me. And if I blow it, it don't matter because the word's gone forth. And if I had that down to an art, I could preach to you and sing and get all the and eyes in there that were needed and it sounded all good and got you all hyped up, but his anointing didn't move in and break. It was a useless waste of time. His word won't return void. But without the anointing that breaks the yoke, without having the one you're preaching about ready to respond to what you're preaching about, what use was it? Some say, well, it's just prayer night Tuesday. It's only prayer. I got this I really need to take care of. It's just prayer night. But the truth is, that prayer night may at times be more important than Bible study. And I know life happens. But even prayer night shouldn't be the only time we pray. Right. Right. So while life's happening, I'm praying. I heard someone once say, well, I pray about it when you can worry about it. Man, have you tried to worry and stuff? It don't seem to make nothing better. It causes people's blood pressure to go up, cholesterol to go up, stress to go up. But if you pray, at least you feel good because you connected more with the one who can do something about it. And then you back up and just wonder, how's he going to do it? We need to get to the place where we begin to speak, Lord, how are you going to do this? Are you going to? Or could you possibly? If we would let our holy imagination get away with us sometimes, and begin to say, Lord, why you could, uh, I got a hundred dollar name. You could, you could send a turtle carrying a hundred dollar bill in his mouth. Well, Lord, I, I need a hundred dollars. You, you could let the wind blow one right on in here. Lord, I, I might just go to the mailbox today and there'd be a check in there I didn't expect. You can do anything, really. If you believe that, you'll speak things that are impossible. I believe you can do anything. He's waiting for you to be his kid and go, my daddy can do anything. I don't care what your daddy can do because my daddy can do it better. Uh -huh. You got your fear thing going on, but I got my love thing going on. Right. Come on. You got your doubt thing going on, your worry thing going on, but I got my faith thing going on. My daddy is bigger than your daddy. When we praise, it is the spirit of war. And what you're doing when you praise is you are declaring what your God can do. Worship's different. Worship's you and God loving each other, talking to each other, feeling after each other. You're intimate with Him. But when you move into praise, you say, thank you, Daddy. You go here and say, let me tell you about my daddy I just spent some time with. Praise talks about who He is, what He is, how He is. Praise is bragging on your God. Praise is declaring that your God is greater than their God. That's praise. And it engages your enemy. But you better have good worship now before you jump into some praising. Because when you go and engage your enemy, you better be sure that your worship will stand beside you and walk with you in the battle. And that you didn't pick a fight that you can't win. Because you didn't know. The scripture says that my people were destroyed for their lack of knowledge. Right in the center of that knowledge is the word no. They're destroyed because they didn't know. And he doesn't need to be that unknown God. 
doesn't need to be that unknown God. There's stuff that we've learned and have programmed through our religious life. And Brother Duke, sometimes we've got to reach a print and go, delete, 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 delete. And then open the book and pray a little bit and go, entry, entry, received, received. We're a computer. Our minds are like computers, man. Garbage in, garbage out. You'll know a man by his the fruit don't come out unless there's a seed. My outward should reflect my inward. It should reflect what's been planted in me. And I need to know my God. Let's stand together.